So everybody and welcome to the channel and the flight briefing room and it's hopefully in its uh, newest location a bit more mobile this time and for those that don't realize it's not brickwork it's a board but anyway um, those that have been uh, around the channel for a while will have seen the background and there's been many comments about whether it, I should sort my brickwork out but I'm quite happy with it as it is anyway this video is looking into two things that I've been very passionate about improving one is making sure I can get a really, really accurate TACA reading uh, for my RPM gauge. And that's dating back to, uh, to the paramotors. I've used this technique now for about six years and it works really, really well on different engines, two stroke, four strokes. It works really well. Anyway, that's one technique we're going to talk about. And the other one, the golden nugget of information about how to get a smooth mid and reliable mid-range um, on my Mosta 185. Now this goes back to some of my earlier videos. Now stick with me here, so bear with me. There's a little bit of an understanding as to how I found this. I know the mid-ranges have always been ru rubbish, but in a paramotor you've got a, fa a fairly accurate and um, malleable throttle which will allow you to almost hide the symptoms of it. I found it when I fitted a hand throttle to my PB. And by setting the hand throttle, I'd expect my RPM to stay exactly where it was. And the more I set it, the more I got frustrated by the fact that it wouldn't actually stay at one set RPM. You'd think that actually fuel air mixture would all be set, leave the hand throttle alone, engine would stay exactly where you put it. No, that didn't happen. So if you want to know how to sort the mid range out, stay with the video. I'll be discussing that later because that needs a little bit more information and understanding. And there's some thanks I need for some articles I found. And I've been developing this for over a year now, and I'm really happy with the results. Those that saw my last video uh, on the uh, position unknown, if you haven't seen that video, link up here, I think it'll be, uh, the engine performed absolutely perfectly literally set the throttle and it didn't move it, it changed less than 100 rpm for 40, in 45 minutes because of where i'd set it because of the adjustments i've made to my carburetor anyway so stick with me for that bit but first off how to get a really reliable rpm um reading the reason i talk about this is i will never do this again i will never ever wrap a taco wire on any of my engines and I haven't done it for about five six years I found a really useful way of doing it now this happened by a happy mistake through some friends of mine they suggested I do something I misunderstood what they said and inadvertently found a really good way of getting a reading anyway so your wire which you wrap the reason you get a reading on your taco is because by wrapping it at 90 degrees to the main current main um, current flow to the spark plug means that that induces a pulse. That pulse then goes down the wire to the box. The box interprets that information and gives you a reading. And that's how your RPM happens. If you put too many wire coils on it, it gives uh, an overreading. It can get saturated and then uh, either overreads or can underread as well. If you if you take too many off, it doesn't produce enough of a um, a pulse, so the, the the gauge can't read it. Now, here's the thing that I found. It was when I had my Maverick paramotor and it had the little uh, silicon bullet connector. I stripped five millimeters off the end of the red coil, um, the, the strip wire, and I touched it to where this. If you look on the screen now, you'll see a picture of the earth kill wire. Now on my, uh, my Maverick machine, I was able to insert it into that connector to basically be touching that wire. That's the positive part of the, the earth kill circuit, which either goes to your button on your hand throttle, or in the case of the PB, there's a bit on the screen now, it's a switch and there's two connectors. When you kill the engine, what you're effectively doing is taking um, part of that coil and you're earthing it back to the engine so it doesn't go down the spark plug and your engine stops. When you turn it on, on my PB, I'm basically breaking that circuit or on a paramotor, you are, you, it's a press to make circuit. So when you, it's sat in your hand, the circuit is always broken. So the engine is always live to start. Now, 
because of the way the magneto works inside the, the, the engine, it's producing a spark. Every time that spark goes to the spark, the, the, the current goes to the spark plug, it's also going to the kill part of the circuit. So if you touch the tip of the wire, as in the exposed part of that wire that you get with your tachometer, into that circuit, basically like a Y part of the circuit, as long as it's touching metal of that part of the circuit, it will also get a reading every time the spark plug gets a spark. So you get a bob-on accurate way of reading. Now it doesn't have to be taken from that point, although I originally did put it to that point. On, um, so it doesn't have to be taken from the spade sp uh, part of the coil. It can be taken from anywhere down that wire. So theoretically, if you've got your hand throttle, that was with my hand throttle on this hand, or you could connect it to the live side of the switch. You only need a really short wire. You don't need to run it all the way back. And that's how I've also done it on my PB. The kill circuit is under the seat. I connect my tachometer to the live side of the switch. Uh, and that is how I can get the pickup for the tachometers. So hopefully that will explain how I get a really accurate reading. I will never ever wrap again. Don't need to. I've done it with varying cheap um, RPM gauges, expensive RPM gauges. I'll leave some details of the RPM gauge that I know that has to have a resistor in that line. So if you want to know about that specific one, and they are fitted to some of the PBs, uh, I don't want to give the name away, but have a look in the description. And it's a thousand ohm resistor that you need to put in line with that. Okay, but most of the other tacos, I normally use the trail tech ones, but they're really hard to get get hold of in the UK. Uh, I use them uh, or, or whatever ones we get off Amazon, and they all seem to work perfectly. I say you only need to connect the red wire. If there's two wires, a black one, do not connect both. You just earth it back out again. So it's a, it's one wire that needs to be connected onto that kill live kill part of the circuit. Hopefully that helps. If you've got any questions and need a little bit more information. Drop your questions in the comments and I will get back to you as best I can. If there's enough of the same question, I'll do a follow-up video. But hopefully that will have helped get the best accurate reading uh, for your engine. And I say, I'll never wrap again. Right. For those that have asked, and there's been loads of people who's asked in the comments, please tell us how you've sorted the mid-range on your carburetor. And sorry if this is a bit of a talky video, but I do need to give some thanks out to a document I found. Um, I think it's the Southwest Air Sports page. Those that have either had uh, a top 80 or most of the engines with the WB37 uh, carb or the WG8 or in the new Monster engines that use the WB3A carburetor. I haven't had too much experience with the factory R engines, but I know they're a completely different carburetor, carburetor again. Uh, they don't seem to have too much of a mid-range issue from the ones that I've, uh, the, the, engine, the few engines I've been involved with, but the W3A or the 37, you have used this system, uh, or I've used this system now, and I've been running it for over a year now, or up to a year, and I really feel I'm dialed in now as to how it works. But this article, and hopefully there'll be a, a link on the screen now, or I will definitely be leaving a, a link in the description. Um, please read the article. And I will also put a caveat on this video that anyone that wants to do this mod in this world of everyone blaming somebody else, please, you will be doing it at your own risk. And also, please do it when you're out of warranty because otherwise you will definitely not uh, be able to make any warranty claims on your engine. So my engine was quite old before I started doing this and I made, definitely made sure I was out of warranty before I started messing around with the car. Right, annoying bits over in terms of caveats, but what I've managed to do is effectively change the fuel air mixture throughout the range of the carburetor. carburetor. The reason I say that is there is a way that we fixed it before and that was to close in the low jet which then made it an absolute pain in the posterior to start now look on the screen right now and you will see a picture of what i've had to do to my carburetor um, butterfly valve throttle valve whatever you want to call it the brass disc i have taken out a huge chunk 
uh, I say a huge chunk in terms of what you can see, uh, it, to allow more air. The reason I've allowed more air is that when that disc now fully shuts, how many people before have had their um, idle adjustment screw, you know, literally hard stopped all the way in to try and get the, the engine to idle? My disc, as you'll see in the picture right now, is practically shut. And that's the position that my uh, disc is at. It's a very slight, a minuscule amount that's open, but it's practically shut. Where that uh, notch is, and there should be a second picture on the screen right now, is immediately over where the idle part of the circuit is. Now on a 3A carb, one of those three holes is blanked off because there's too much fuel. And this notch, and again, if you look in the description, I'll put the dimensions of my um, uh, cutout on the screen. The dimensions are definitely in the description. Uh, it took me a day and about six attempts of slowly doing individual files um, to get to that length. If your hole is too big, you'll get a runaway engine where you cannot control the idle at all because again, the throttle's shut and you cannot uh, close the air down enough and, it, and basically the RPM will run away. Before you do this, buy a second disc because if you screw the first one up, you can always try again. So brass disc, it's very easy to bend, it's very easy to cut too much away. And that's why I say I've put those dimensions in the, in the description. So slowly, slowly take enough away that you can get to a position where you have a reliable idle and you will also be able to do static ground runs, you don't need to fly it, that you will get a smooth transition through to the mid-range. Now the jump normally happens between 5,800 and 5,900, which is kind of where most people would fly on a, on a high trimmed out position. Or if you're trying to do foot dragging, where you're right in that power band of where it's jumping and it will jump quite quickly and then you have to come back off the power at the wrong time. So this has moved for me, my mid range, where it really starts to jump into the point where the high jet is now taking over. This all might sound really geeky, but effectively you've got the low jet, the high jet, and a transition between the two. And this is where we're trying to change the fuel air mixture. Now the reason I mentioned about the article, and again that link will be in the description, is there's so much more information in there than I can portray in this short video, and I don't want to be gabbling on to you, that it will explain basically what you need to do to achieve this and I want to show you what I've done following that information to achieve this. Now there is one key thing here, you do need an accurate cylinder head temperature gauge. If you don't have an accurate and reliable cylinder head temperature gauge, and I'm not saying I'm running an EGT because that would be the ultimate goal, you then won't be able to tell in the mid range if you've got the right setting, okay? I also haven't touched my top jet from factory. My top jet is still set, it's only the low jet. And believe it or not, I've actually had to open up my low jet because there is now more air. There's more air fuel flow mixture going through the carburetor, which then changes the, the switch over. I think they call it the mixture lag between the two. And that's why you're able to smooth out the mid range, okay? Now, as I say, I'm trying to keep my thoughts concise without jumping too much around. Again, if you've got any more questions on how I've achieved this, please drop them in the comments. The other side of it is linking in with the metering lever and pop-off spring. Now, I don't use the Vitarazzi pop-off spring. I use um, a part number from um, Walbro. It's So this is the part number, which again, I'll leave in the description as well. It's 98-299. Sorry, I'm sad remembering that. Uh, and that's the pop-off spring I'm using. All the aspects of getting an engine to run reliably are pop-off pressure, metering lever, which is what's set by this gauge, okay? And pretty much uh, my metering lever is on that, on that gauge. If anything, it's a hair's breadth. You could put a bit of paper between it and the metering lever lower than that gauge, okay? But again, if it's too low, low is lean, you're going to lean your mixture out. And again, this is where the cylinder head temperature comes in. So that's the metering lever and pop-off spring. Uh, so pretty much factory on the metering lever height, but I've changed it for a different spring. 
my pop-off spring resets at the correct 10, it doesn't go below 10, it's between 12 and um, about 12 PSI, but it does pop off between 16 and 18 PSI. So I've got a much higher pop-off pressure, which again, leans it out a little bit more. And this is why I've left my top jets factory and I've opened up my low end. Linking in with the disc, that is smoothed out the fuel air mixture right through the range. And I say I've got a much more reliable um, RPM gauge in that there have been some flights where it has started to creep up, but then it's brought itself back down again. But most of the time it's pretty much set where I leave it and it's just been a joy to fly. And that's kind of why I wanted to make this video was just to tell you that it is possible to fix the mid range on the Warbro carb. It just takes a little bit more uh, engineering and finesse. Going back to the, the disc, the, the throttle disc or butterfly disc, whatever you want to call it, make sure that when you are filing it, you do it between two bits of uh, wood, soft wood in a vise, and just gently with a file, work away to get that arc um, that you've, you'll see in the picture. There have been other videos that have talked about how to uh, adjust the low and the high end. Um, as I said, I've fixed my high end, I'm not, I'm not touching that. And say so the Scout Paramotor videos are really good um, for adjusting the low end. Now, what I'm also doing is allowing my low jet to be a lot higher, but that also means that I've got a very reliable um, and easy starting engine. My, as you've probably seen in some of the videos, literally from cold, prime it, pull through three times, one good start, one hand, and it starts. And I think my engine from cold will idle happily about 17, 1800 RPM and then tickle it. And as it warms up, the idle comes up to the 2100 to 2200. So I've been really pleased about this. I have been reticent about giving away how I've done it, but the main point is please do it at your own risk. Make sure that everything is clean, sanitized. Everything's been deburred with the throttle disc. Again, the part numbers that I've used, I'll put in the description. Hopefully this has been of help. Again, I really hope that other people have had success, uh, the same success that I have had with this. I appreciate the Viterazzi are doing their, their thing with engines to try and make them run as well as they can. They are lovely engines, but it was just the one area I wanted to get right. So probably gabbering on, this has been a long video of probably listening to me talk, but I wanted to pass on all the information that I found that will help you. Let's say, please read the article. Uh, I say there's, there's a big thank you to, I think it's Jerry Farrell who wrote the article. It does give his name at the top of the article. Uh, read it, it is lo there's loads of information there. And again, just make sure you've got your tools, you've got your metering lever gauge, you've got your pop-off gauge. Uh, all those bits and pieces, soft file, and just have fun, and hopefully you'll have had the same success that I had. I'm going to wrap this video up here. So if you're a new new viewer to the channel, hopefully you'll follow me more on the adventures, where, uh, either my flying side or whatever we produce in the flight briefing room. Uh, if you do like the video, give it a thumbs up. And so I don't normally say that, but apparently it helps the YouTube algorithm if you do like the video. Um, we'll leave this video here. Uh, safe engineering and until next time everybody fly safe let's get the rpm set for cruise it is so nice just being able to leave this engine to just i mean what am i doing now 5700 give or take 30 rpm and for me that's just magical set the hand throttle leave it it's puttering away <laughs>